Institute of Science. We have uh, two exciting talks by Joel Moore and by Pedram Rushan, and uh, we also have a discussion on quantum computing. So let's just get started. Our first speaker, Joel Moore, will tell us about quantum magnetism as a source of unusual fluids and fractional particles. Thanks very much, Rajiv, for the chance to speak here. It's nice to see this crowd of people, even if it's only online. Um, and at least what I have to talk about, I hope is a little bit happier than what we were just talking about, which is COVID restrictions. There are really two parts to the talk. Um, you could view it as uh, how great things are in one dimension and how hard some things still are in two dimensions. Uh, maybe a more optimistic viewpoint is in 1D, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of theoretical background, um, including some of the, the stuff that uh, Steve talked about yesterday um, but also a little bit more generally on, we now understand some things about dynamics in one dimension that I think are very intuitive and probably could have been understood quite a long time ago, but were only understood in the last decade or so and, and work by a fairly large number of people. Um, and then the, the right figure on this cover slide is about a problem that we all know very well, which is frustrated magnetism, um, specifically on the triangular lattice, but maybe close to a Mott transition. Um, and there, I guess I have a combination of things to say, uh, but I, I would stress that we don't have the perfect agreement of theory, numerics, and experiment that we sometimes get in one dimension. Uh, we have a lot of theoretical work and maybe even a bit of understanding of why one particular spin liquid could happen near the Mott transition. Um, and I also have some experimental stuff to talk about, but it's not quite uh, about the same phase. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about kind of a hard and unsolved problem at the end is as a lead in to the rest of this morning, um, it turns out that a little bit of computational progress is coming from out of left field, as we might say, from uh, people doing quantum calculations on quantum computers. Um, so I'll try to explain a little bit uh, why they care about our sort of materials all of a sudden. All right, so the, the first um, part of the talk is really about dynamics and systems where we understand the ground state quite well. And as you've probably noticed, uh, there's been a lot of work in different limits of dynamics over the past 10 or so years. Uh, one famous example is many body localization where we don't even get uh, thermalization, however long we wait. Um, but even leaving that aside, there are many other possibilities for dynamics in a closed quantum system. And I just wrote up a few of the ones we often deal with here. So diffusion is probably the simplest, uh, finite diffusion constant, finite conductivity, et cetera. Um, we might have dynamics of an order parameter like time dependent Ginzburg-Landau. Uh, if we have very clean solids, we might hope that electrons behave like a fluid, either a standard fluid like water or maybe something more exciting. Um, and then integrable systems, you might think, uh, behave like free particles where they move ballistically. Um, and it turns out that sometimes that's true and sometimes it's not. And I'll say a little bit about uh, when it's true and when even when they're ballistic, there's some modification because of the interactions. Um, and that modification is very easy to picture. Um, but then I'll go on to, uh, Maybe the most exciting case is the one Steve already talked about, but I'll only say a little bit more about uh, that so-called Kardar Parisi Zhang case. Um, so this is kind of the one-dimensional part of the talk is mostly about dynamics. Um, but maybe the excitement is, you know, for for a long time, um, for at least ten years or so, we've had pretty good um, numerics, even for dynamics in one dimension, and it's a great sort of closed quantum laboratory as long as we've got local interactions, not too large a Hilbert space, and so on. Um, but it turns out that both neutrons and atoms are now capable, in other words, atomic physics experiments are now capable of seeing these quantum dynamical regimes. Um, so that's kind of fun. Uh, but it is uh, a case where maybe theoretically we already had pretty good tools. Um, and then in 2D, uh, it's much harder. So as everyone here, I think, probably knows, we still don't understand which ground state uh, appears for some fairly simple Hamiltonians, like the Kagame lattice is one example that is still um, you know, not clear what the ground state is, at least from the people I talked to. Um, for the triangular lattice, I'm going to present uh, how we sort of got interested in going back to Anderson's original spin liquid proposal, uh, but moving closer to the Mott point so we don't just have three sub-lattice order. Um, and, and this would be sort of conventional, I guess, approaches, uh, no quantum computation in this part, um, but we, we, we and other groups started to see numerically a kind of unexpected state there. Um, and the main progress I want to talk about, which is now out in PRL, led by my student Tessa Cookmeyer, 
is why. Uh, why do you seem to get a chiral spin liquid, which is not what we expected in the triangular lattice Hubbard model? Um, and then I'll talk about the experimental situation on the triangular lattice, which is quite complicated. Um, and that's kind of leading into uh, the connection to quantum computing in the next talk. Um, so the basic point I will make is one limitation of, you know, why can't we do as well in 2D as we can in 1D is that in 1D, we can calculate dynamics and we can compare very well to neutron scattering and kind of know what the signatures are of different dynamical regimes. In two dimensions, our ability to calculate dynamics is quite limited. So there's been a lot of progress in ground states, and I will talk about some of that. Um, I'm not going to really talk about computational methods in detail. Um, I'll just more talk about analytic theory, but the, the computation is important in the background. Um, but we can't really do dynamics, and that means it's hard to know uh, just from looking at neutron data what it's telling us. And that's where one might hope that the quantum computers in the next talk could help us a bit. Um, and there's a reason why our problems, uh, let's say quantum magnetism problems in this talk, are pretty good problems for the first generation of quantum computers, the ones we have now, which are not enormous and they're a little noisy, um, but they are beyond what we can do with exact diagonalization, at least above 1D. Um, so I'll try to sort of justify what I'm saying on this slide, which is uh, there's a reason why these quantum magnetism pro problems are very well suited to the current quantum computers and why maybe on the five or 10 year timescale, we could hope they will tell us something that we don't already know. So I'll, I'll try to explain why. All right, so the, uh, the one dimensional part, maybe the big surprise is that even at almost room temperature in real materials, there are new dynamical regimes that appear and it doesn't even depend on being above a critical point or something like that. And then the second is, uh, Another way to state it is how is the, the changes in our ability to do different kinds of computation um, making a difference in one of our holy grails, which is to find fractional states of spin. Um, and you know, an example that I don't have anything new to say about, I just put it up because it's amazing that this is still a hard problem. Um, if we just look at the nearest neighbor Heisenberg antiferromagnet on the Kagame lattice, um, some people will say that that has a gapped ground state and others will say that it's a Dirac spin liquid maybe. Um, and I, I have friends in both camps and I don't have anything to say about it myself, but that's the kind of problem where even the ground state after many years of effort is still pretty non-trivial. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the triangular lattice instead where we do at least know some things pretty well. All right, on to the talk. So um, why are dynamics important and what is kind of the standard thing we assume and then how might it break down? I think the, the standard way we calculate dynamics uh, is one of many things that goes back to Einstein. Um, who was thinking about classical physics, but the same principle is good for us. Uh, so he was thinking about Brownian motion, say a heavy particle in a fluid of light particles. And the idea was, well, suppose I make a density gradient of the heavy particles, then because of their random motion, I will see that there's a current that tends to equalize that density gradient. And you can actually calculate the diffusion constant in Fick's law as an integral over a dynamical correlation function at equilibrium. Um, so the way I, I, I think of this intuitively is like a fluctuation dissipation idea where um, the way that a system gets back to equilibrium doesn't really care about whether we pushed it away by making the density gradient or by applying an electric field in a solid or whether it fluctuated away because it's a thermal system so it has fluctuations. Um, and because they it gets back to equilibrium the same way, there's this quantitative relationship. But clearly it's pretty important for this uh, what equilibrium was so if we change the nature of equilibrium, um, either by going to momentum conservation, say like in a fluid or by going to integrability, then we're also going to change the way that uh, transport works. So the way to connect this to experiments, the sort of standard model would be, we've got one conservation law, uh, let's say it's a number of particles, then the way things will spread in time, if I start from a delta function is like a Gaussian. Uh, it will expand. This is a nice solution of the diffusion equation and so on. And to translate that to the kind of experiments you heard about, um, if we're talking about spin, you know, this could be NMR or it could be uh, neutrons. If we're thinking about spin dynamics, then what replaces number of particles is say spin density. Um, that might be conserved if we've got say a Heisenberg or XXZ Hamiltonian um, and that will spread and that will have a certain scaling, which is again, like diffusion. So that's kind of the the null hypothesis that you might expect in a solid. Um, the most common way that things can be different from diffusion is if you've got momentum conservation, 
on some scale. And as you've probably heard, uh, it is possible to make electrons behave like a fluid because momentum is effectively conserved. Probably the first really clear examples of that were in the 90s by people like Lorenz Mollenkamp working with two-dimensional electron gases. Um, but more recently, it's been possible to make more kinds of solids that are clean enough that momentum is effectively conserved long enough for interactions to happen. And then you would get something like water. You would get convective physics rather than diffusive physics. And that's quite nice, but it's not really what I'm going to talk about. Um, the main reason I wrote up these equations is the way to maybe think about hydrodynamics in general is uh, it's the, the description once you have local equilibrium. So for example, in these equations, uh, I've assumed that a few collisions happened. So the local system was well-defined by say number density, velocity or momentum and energy density. And the reason why uh, there are three parameters or three variables is that there are three conservation laws in an ordinary fluid. And then in, in air that might set up in some tiny fraction of a millisecond, but then there are many orders of magnitude where local equilibrium is established. And the, the slow process described by hydrodynamics is how local equilibrium becomes global equilibrium. And that's also going to be true in integrable models. Um, what makes it look like it might be hard is that there are an infinite number of conserved quantities. So you might worry, I need to write an infinite list of Euler equations and that's going to be hard. It turns out you only have to write one equation and that in a sense, um, the Boltzmann equation is no longer going to be kind of a, a predecessor of fluid equations, Euler equations. Um, it's almost equivalent in integrable models. Um, and the Boltzmann equation is just one equation. So I'll try to give you some intuition um, for why that's true. And the great thing is, you know, sometimes in integral models, there's a lot of technology, um, but here the idea is fairly simple. Um, the models I'm gonna talk about, uh, the, the main one I'm going to focus on is the XXZ spin chain, which is generalizing the Heisenberg spin chain to allow uh, the possibility of anisotropic interactions. Let's say I, I might have uh, an easy axis magnet if I crank up JZ to be larger. Uh, which we think of as delta larger than one in the usual way to parametrize this. Um, and, or I could have an easy plane magnet if JZ is small compared to JXX. I could also apply magnetic fields, but I'm, I'm not going to do that much in this talk, if at all. So we can solve this. We can also solve the, the Bose gas with delta function interactions. That's one of the realizations that people can do in atomic physics. Um, and it's been known for a long time how to do the exact thermodynamics of these models. And then more recently, people have done a lot of work on different aspects of non-equilibrium like quenches and so on. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is how some sort of fluid-like quantities um, are actually relatively easy in this class of integrable models. Uh, and, and, and easy, but not trivial in terms of the predictions that come out, at least at the Heisenberg point. So the reason why you might be worried or, or you know, what does it mean to say that there are an infinite list of conserved quantities in the Heisenberg model or this is written for the XXZ model. Um, this is what they look like, but we're not going to have to work with them. So there's an infinite list of conserved quantities, uh, which are the Qs here, and there's an infinite list of conserved momenta, and they're just products of spin operators. As you go down the list, you have to use more spin operators and so on. But you can see that working directly with the conservation laws and writing Euler equations for them would not be a lot of fun. And the notation here is, uh, when there are a bunch of upper indices, that means, say, if I've got five upper indices, that means the product of five spin operators on neighboring sites. So they're just products of poly matrices, but there are a lot of them. So the sort of history of what we're going to do, um, so there's, as I mentioned, many different integral models, many different kinds of progress, but if we just focus on the Heisenberg chain, here's a little bit of history. Uh, Beta figured out the ground state in 1931. About 40 years later, people figured out the thermodynamics. Um, so at any finite temperature, it was known how to do the free energy, but dynamical questions, even very basic ones, like is it ballistic or is it diffusive, um, remain perplexing. And there were debates between smart people. It turns out the answer is uh, they're either both wrong or both right. Uh, it's this other dynamics that Steve told you about. But the, the sort of beginning of the breakthrough, I would say for the Heisenberg and XXZ models, is that half of the conservation laws had been missed until work of Thomas Prozen in 2011. And around the same time, uh, we had figured out that it, it did have to be ballistic, at least in some range of parameters. So that agreed with 
uh, what his conservation laws were telling us, but they're very different from the conservation laws I just wrote down. They're actually not local in the same sense. They have kind of an envelope. At first, you have to make them on a computer, and uh, it, it's pretty technical. Um, but that insight sort of started um, an avalanche of things that rapidly became less technical and more intuitive and even connected to experiment. Um, but the basic idea, I mean, starting in 2011, it became clear that once you had this missing piece of the puzzle in the XXZ or Heisenberg models, a lot of things made a lot more sense and you could start to compute various far from equilibrium things and see that they worked against numerics. Um, but they were all sort of still ballistic with corrections until 2019. Um, and they didn't really have a lot of experimental, I don't know, impact until 2019 or so. And then most recently, uh, that paper from last year that Steve talked about. So what happened in 2019, so I'm going to give a little bit of background before this about um, the thing that I can explain intuitively is what happens in integrable models like the easy plane case, when it turns out the physics is still ballistic with z equal to one, but there's a very simple and beautiful correction. There's kind of a modified Boltzmann equation. Um, the part where we still don't really know how to derive things microscopically is, is exactly at the Heisenberg point. Um, but what I wanna sketch is that the Heisenberg point, maybe the, the reason why it sort of makes sense that it's z equal to three halves, the Heisenberg point is right between a region which is ballistic z equal to one, and a region which is sort of Ising ordered with z equal to two. So if you had to pick something between z equal to one and z equal to two, maybe that's uh, plausible that it's some other universality class that's super diffusive, and that is indeed what happens. But here I want to stress, this is kind of, you know, a numerical and empirical observation. It is possible to derive from integrability the number z equal to three halves, um, but deriving, say, the noisy Berger's equation, the kind of noisy diffusion equation that gives you cardar prezi zhang dynamics um, is, is still hard. Uh, and for people who weren't around yesterday, uh, just to, I don't want to repeat everything Steve said, but the basic idea is um, there is a famous universality class in soft condensed matter physics uh, that describes sort of the leading nonlinear correction to diffusion uh, and in various other systems as well. And it has a, a scaling function and everything, but it's not a Gaussian. So it's, if you like, it's a bit like diffusion. It's got a scaling function and an exponent, but the scaling function is not a Gaussian and the exponent is not uh, z equal to two, it's z equal to three halves. Um, so what that means in practice, it, it, it should mean a very significant change in the dynamics at the Heisenberg point, which is instead of linear spread, which is the red curve, uh, or instead of diffusive spread, which is the green curve, you should get this blue behavior in between. And how you can see that experimentally um, was one subject that you might have heard about yesterday. So theoretically, um, the kind of key ingredient for this uh, is what I mentioned, which if I just look at the XXZ model, there are really three regimes. Um, if I took that delta parameter, so kind of the relative strength of the Z coupling, delta equal to zero is famously solvable. It's actually just free fermions in disguise. Um, so that, and you know that free fermions are ballistic. And it turns out that as you add interactions to the free fermions, they remain ballistic until you hit a critical interaction strength. And that critical interaction strength is just where it becomes isotropic in the spin representation. At that point, you no longer have ballistic transport. The so-called Druda weight, which is the strength of ballistic transport is zero, but you don't have diffusion either. It's like you've got an infinite conductivity is equal to three halves. And then once you make it even more anisotropic, that's when you get uh, diffusion. So can you see this? Well, in a solid, it's tough to tune between these regimes. It turns out it can be done with atoms. Um, but you can, uh, let's say, find a material that is close to the Heisenberg point and look. Um, but first, let me explain what happens on the ballistic side, because this is the part that I think is, is intuitive and maybe explains why hydrodynamics of integral models is actually kind of simple. And the reason is, you know, what makes one model integrable when another is not? And the reason is, uh, it's mathematically summarized in the Yang-Baxter equation maybe, but the idea is that in an integrable model, uh, even when many particles come together and collide with each other, their momenta asymptotically are sort of conserved. In other words, if you looked at them far away, they would come out with the same momentum that the momenta that they went in with. Uh, collisions don't really randomize everything. There, there are no collisions in kind of the Boltzmann equation sense where two momenta come in and then two different momenta come out. Instead, what happens is shown for classical solitons in the left figure here. So these are solitons of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. 
But it turns out that the kind of hydrodynamics that appears in the XXZ chain in the easy plane regime is very much, it's actually the same form of equation that was known for like a dense gas of solitons and the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So what happens is I've got two solitons moving right, uh, horizontal axis is time, vertical axis is space, soliton is a little lump of energy. And what happens is they, they pass through each other, but they've slightly delayed each other. You can see that the dotted lines are the, the straight line trajectories they were on. So in an integral model, the basic effect of collisions is not to randomize things. It doesn't give an increase of entropy. It just gives a delay, at least in this, uh, until I get to the Heisenberg point, which is special. Quantum mechanically, you know, we can't really talk about things in quite the same language, but we know that integral models have phase shifts. And now integrability means that phase shifts kind of combine in a very simple way. And Wigner taught us that a phase shift is a bit like a delay, semi-classically. So that means we should try to write down a Boltzmann equation where there are no true collisions, um, but the streaming is a bit funny because the velocity at, with which one particle moves depends on how much it's delayed from the other particles at the same space-time point. Um, and that leads to what we like to call a beta Boltzmann equation. Uh, it's also sometimes called generalized hydrodynamics, although generalized hydrodynamics, I'd say is the full, either the Euler equations or this, but the point is this one equation is kind of describing what an infinite set of Euler equations would do. And it's just like the streaming part of a Boltzmann equation with one change. Um, instead of having uh, velocities of a given momentum in space, the velocity has to be determined from what all the other particles are doing. So it's now an integral differential equation, but not too hard to solve, just one equation and actually a known kind of equation from classical physics. And the main point is, there are no collisions on the right-hand side, no increase of entropy. So at least until we get to the isotropic point, integral models are surprisingly simple. And this might sound too good to be true. So we did a bunch of simulations. Um, and before I show those to try to convince you that this all works without doing a lot of derivations, um, there is a very nice recent derivation by Fabian Essler and collaborators, if you're curious. Um, the way to state it, maybe in abstract terms, is that normal hydrodynamics, you reach local equilibrium with three parameters, after some quick collision time, and then things follow Navier-Stokes type equations. In an integrable fluid, you rapidly reach a, another kind of local equilibrium, which is sometimes called generalized Gibbs ensemble. It's like Gibbs equilibrium, but with more parameters because there are more conservation laws. And then that equation I wrote down, this sort of modified Boltzmann equation, again, describes how things move around after that initial period. So it, it doesn't solve the quench problem, and it doesn't solve various other things that people have worked on, but at least for this kind of fluid mechanics, um, it works pretty well. Uh, so here, these are two curves on top of each other, and I'll zoom in on one to show the agreement, but the basic idea is let's just run a time-dependent simulation on our computer of a spin chain where I've heated up the middle of the spin chain, and this is interacting. Uh, it's sort of delta equal to 0.5 or so, and I can watch that lump of energy spread out, and I can compare it to the prediction of that generalized hydrodynamics or beta Boltzmann equation. Um, and it agrees pretty well. So I, I've got uh, blue and gold here and you can see they lie pretty well on top of each other. So it's pleasing when things work and you know we can do sort of a, a hot side on the left and a cold side on the right. And the main point is at least until we got to the Heisenberg point, we understood things pretty well starting with these generalized hydrodynamics papers by two groups um, in 2016. So, um, I guess I, I, I don't have the zoomed in picture, but let's say the agreement seems to be uh, very good over the time scales we can do on the computer. And there are even arguments theoretically that if you define the asymptotic limit properly, this is kind of the, the right physics at long times. Joel, question. Uh, what were the adjustable parameters in those fits? Yeah, so we have uh, prepared an initial condition, which is, uh, there, there really aren't any in the sense, the initial condition that we've set up is what we feed into the hydrodynamical equations. So we've given sort of a certain energy profile at time zero, mm -hmm. um, and we put that energy profile uh, into the hydrodynamical equations and run it forward. Um, so there aren't really any adjustable parameters. Um, so so you had to adjust the diffusion constant and things like that, I guess, right? Uh, no, no, we, we, we just, uh, yeah, the, the the, the, there is no free parameter in the beta ansatz. I mean, if you like, you know, there's a value of J, the Heisenberg coupling or the- And, and, there's a value of and you know how to calculate the quantities in the hydrodynamics from J. That's right. So basically what this is saying is that some dynamical questions 
we can calculate just as well as we could the thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. um, like in the thermodynamics from the beta ansatz, there's no free parameter. Mm -hmm. And I, I just should be clear, we can't calculate everything, but basically fluid-like problems where you've got finite temperature and finite density, mm -hmm. um, this new, you know, there is some pretty good progress in the last decade or so. Uh, that's kind of the point. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel, can I, can I ask, wait, you, you mentioned that, that um, when you, uh, that, that in inter integral models, you, you first, uh, the dynamics first approaches a, a local uh, generalized Gibbs state with, with how many, uh, you know, how many, uh, you know, Lagrange multipliers are involved in that though? It would be an infinite number, but the thing is, so what we're working with, uh, this is like the magic of how in an integral model, the Boltzmann equation is in a sense equivalent to Euler equations. The one particle distribution function, let me explain how it might work for Lieb Liniger. So suppose I thought about Lieb Liniger where the conserved quantities are easy to state. So normally if I had a gas, the conserved quantities would be kind of integrals over the one particle distribution of one K and K squared. Those would be like number density, momentum density, and energy density. So in, in the Lieb Liniger, uh, in the boson case, the, the conserved quantities are now all moments, like K cubed, sorry, uh, K the fourth and so on. So I could work with that infinite list of moments, which would be a pain, but we kind of know that under physics assumptions for a positive you know, decaying function, knowing all the moments is basically equivalent to knowing the function. So I might as well just work with the function. And that's what the Boltzmann equation is about. The Boltzmann equation is about the one particle distribution function. So in other words, in ordinary hydrodynamics, um, you work with just three numbers, or you know, one's a vector, fine. Um, and those are three moments of a function. In generalized hydrodynamics, you should work with all the moments of the function. But then you might as well, that's equivalent to working with the full function. So now we've got an equation which is you know, not for a few numbers, it's for the full momentum distribution, but it's just this PDE. And there's nothing free here because we know the self-consistent velocity, it's kind of the dressed velocity in the beta ansatz, so that we sort of know. Um, so it's kind of you know, basically saying you, you can leverage what you know about thermodynamic beta ansatz to do some dynamical properties, uh, which yeah, is a nice, uh, simple way to look at things. Can I ask one question quickly on the collision term? So I didn't quite understand the statement that no collision term since quasi particles retain their identity. What does that mean? Yeah, so, okay, so normally if I, okay, so one dimension, if I had elastic collisions of two particles in, in any V of R, they would come out with the same momenta. But if I had four or five or six particles come together, then with the generic interaction, you know, if they're all coming close enough together to kind of interact at the same time, with the generic interaction, their momenta would get randomized and I would see an increase uh, maybe in the, in the number of, in the entropy and things like that. Like in higher dimensions, certainly collisions kind of randomize momenta. Um, but the point of the way collisions work, you know, suppose in the integrable model, if I even had more particles coming together, like four or five or six, they would all, you know, interfere with each other. There'd be some complicated interaction region, but they would still come out at the end of the day, once they were far apart from each other, they, there would still be the same velocities that they came in with. Um, so that's what I mean by saying collisions in integral models are special. Um, they don't really have the effect of randomizing momenta that you would generically expect. So this is an exact statement. This is not an, an approximation that the collision term is, is not put in. Um, that's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, as Sorry. I said, you know, there's work by more mathematical people than I am toward trying to establish this as kind of a rigorous description in some limit. Thank you. Well, a bit, bit, bit of a different question. Uh, I'm just wondering about the validity of this hydrodynamic regime, right? Where does it end? And what crosses my mind is, right, that we know that when you go to long distances, right, the, the uh, spin chase, blah, blah, will map onto two-dimensional CFTs that are in turn integrable. Would it be so the case that when you uh, would take the uh, CFT and repeat the procedure, that you could, could pull this, this hydrodynamical attitude all the way to the DPUV because there's no scale, right? That basically the trouble is coming from curvature, blah, blah. You have any idea? Yeah. I mean, it's a very good question, and we wrote a, a recent paper to try to understand how it works in detail. So what I would say is, okay, I mentioned that this holds under kind of the normal assumptions of fluid mechanics, which include like finite temperature and finite particle density. Um, but as you say, in kind of the UV low temperature limit, we know that we should get a Luttinger liquid or conform. I mean, Luttinger liquid is the free boson CFT. We know that we should get a CFT essentially free description. So in that sense, the low temperature limit should be not just integrable, but free. 
Um, but at finite temperature, we ought to start to see this physics. And I think I have one slide on that, um, but it is a very good question. You know, and the answer is um, there's a crossover in time where uh, if you're at some fine, I, okay, if you went down to zero temperature, it would always be free. Um, but if, here I've put in some energy density, so it's not at zero temperature. So there's an amount of time after which fluid mechanics sort of becomes valid. But as examples of the kind of things that you couldn't solve with this method, if I gave you like a finite number of particles well-spaced or something, you'd have to solve that with old fashioned methods. It, this kind of depends on uh, a fluid cell and continuity and things like that. So it is like a fluid limit. But, uh, so, so it might be, right? So I'm a bit in the uh, holography business and uh, I, don't, I don't do it myself, but there's this sense that when you start out with pure CFT and you sit on temperature and you look at the hydro, right? That, it suffice up to remarkably small momenta. Uh, it's basically like that, that at the moment you hit the cutoff, which is temperature, right? At that point in time, you kind of lose momentum. That's sort of the take home message of this, uh, of this whole affair out there. Yeah, so here it's, it's kind of restating, I think what you said in, in our language for the Heisenberg chain. So I skipped ahead a few slides, but the basic idea is, yeah, there's, there is a low temperature Luttinger liquid, which is a CFT that we're kind of often taught. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, if you, you you have to wait an amount of time for the onset of KPZ that is like the inverse of temperature. But then you go to uh, away from the free CFT to to sort of the interacting one. Exactly. Like as many of these systems are still valid, uh, right? The one or the other way. Uh, doing some extra well, I, I would say it's, it's still not, okay, once you're at non-zero temperature, it, and it's not necessarily like a pure CFT anymore because, you know, there's, if you like, there's curvature of the bands and things like exactly. that. Like right. yeah, yeah. So these are irrelevant operators in the CFT language. That, that basically... Exactly. But once we're at finite right. temperature, then, then we have to worry about irrelevant operators. Yeah. Yep. All right. So um, anyway, so there, there's nice agreement. There's an experiment which you heard about. And again, you know, just for anyone who missed yesterday, I've got one message, which is uh, the point is to look in a different place than where people had understood spin-ons in this material. So before you would look at low temperature and relatively high energy, and they were able to prove people like Steve Nagler and Alan Tennant and so on were able to prove the existence of spin-ons in this material. Um, but now what they did is look at uh, high temperature and low energy. Um, and that's when you start to see these fluid-like properties. And maybe this could be used for other fluid regimes. I don't know. Um, so it agrees well. Uh, this is what I already talked about in response to Jan's question. Uh, it, this is uh, consistent with what we're taught about low temperature limits. Um, there's a, a crossover time scale, and you can kind of make sure that other things appear. So if you want to see what it looks like in detail, um, this is a dynamical spin correlation. It's like what's measured in NMR. And actually, this paper, since I know we have at least one NMR expert on the call, we were really hoping someone would take uh, potassium copper fluoride or another system and redo NMR on it more carefully, because we think that this kind of crossover could actually be seen better in NMR, maybe than even in neutrons. Um, but so far, we haven't had luck in convincing someone. But I, just in case anyone wants to give it a try, please talk to Steve and uh, yeah, do something. Anyway. Uh, the, the point here is you wait a certain amount of time before you see the onset of that magic KPZ power law in this correlator, the T to the minus two thirds, and the amount of time you have to wait as a function of temperature. All right, so that basically concludes the 1D story. Uh, and it's good because I've got 20 minutes left uh, and I'll, I'll try to finish on time. So the reason we might care about two dimensions is, well, there are a lot more materials in two and 3D and there are a lot of new physical things that only happen in 2 and 3D. At least topology sort of happens in 1D, but it's much more interesting in 2D and 3D. Um, so I'm going to talk about one kind of spin liquid candidate that's even older than the Kagame lattice. Um, Kagame lattice is something that is still hard. Uh, and why it's kind of an interesting problem for new quantum computers is maybe my last slide or two. But the rest is sort of standard. Until I get to that, it's basically standard condensed matter. Um, many people here will be familiar with this problem and what's been tried over the years. So I have one little new piece of the story, but I can't be nearly as definitive as I could be in 1D. And in fact, the experimental situation I will try to talk about, even though I'm a theorist, and the experimental situation is, is complicated, I think it's fair to say. Uh, or at least different materials do different things. I mean, I don't think it's inconsistent. Um, so topological phase, we know one reason we might go to higher dimensions is to try to get fractional particles with fractional statistics. That's one beautiful thing um, that can happen sort of in 1D, but much more elegantly in higher dimensions, maybe. Um, and then a, you know, there, there are 
is a longstanding goal of building different kinds of quantum computers. Some of them even use topological materials. Um, but what I want to kind of build toward is, you know, why are our, well, first a little bit on our sort of problem, um, and then a little bit on why it's interesting to people like uh, what you'll hear about later on, quantum computers. So we have theoretical ways of making topological phases, and one easy one is to start with the many, many one electron phases we have, and now build them with some kind of fractional particle like a parton. But that's not the most rigorous thing in the world, and it doesn't always give you very clear even experimental signatures. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is a bit more microscopic. Um, and maybe let me explain one reason why even as computational methods get better, and I'll talk about some fairly state-of-the-art DMRG calculations. Uh, most of what I wanna say is about analytical pictures. Um, and that's because, you know, I think uh, even though I'm gonna talk now about correlated things, um, even though they're hard compared to one electron things, uh, there are things that depend on correlations that only happen because of correlations and they're very beautiful. And we've managed to say a lot through methods that are kind of hard to explain to a computer scientist. But I'd say the way we've made a lot of progress on correlated systems is often not with some super powerful computer at first, it's having uh, a model that is maybe a toy model, we sometimes use that term, but has the right physics in it. And that we can sort of argue is adiabatically connected to reality. If, if that's a good model, it should have some unique signature. And then we, we wanna have a signature that is only there, if you like, for our interesting proposed phase and would differentiate it from other phases. Um, and the, the point is we'd still want understanding like this, even if we have a computer that gives us all the numbers, I guess. Um, so with DMRG, um, there are problems that DMRG is pretty effective for now, even in two dimensions, at least for ground states. So the Kagame seems to have competing states that differ very slightly in energy. What I want to talk about is um, a problem with a long history, which is Anderson's uh, original thought process for spin liquids. Um, we now know that the specific limit that Anderson was talking about is not a spin liquid, but if you move away from it toward a Mott transition, um, then things get a little bit more interesting and there's a lot of discussion recently. So uh, let's think about the Hubbard model on the triangular lattice. If we go deep into the insulating phase, then it becomes the nearest neighbor Heisenberg model. And the nearest neighbor Heisenberg model, I think it's been known since the late eighties, uh, people like Elser and Hughes say that um, that's got three sub lattice. So it's got long range order, it's non-collinear, but it's not super exciting as far as topology and so on. Um, so if we aren't that insulating, so in other words, if we're still on the insulating side of the mod transition, but we move closer, then people doing series expansions kind of know what are the first terms beyond the Heisenberg model that you produce. And we can ask, you know, theoretically, what do those terms do? Um, or the first numerics that we did on this problem was let's just do the Hubbard model. So this is DMRG on kind of a six by infinity ladder. It's not an infinite system. Um, there are certainly, you know, ways in which it could not be right about the two-dimensional limit. Um, but I can say that other groups have started to see what we see, at least uh, several other groups, maybe not all. Um, what we found was that as you get close to the mod transition, so U over T maybe between eight and 10, uh, we thought we might see a spin liquid, but we expected to see a different one from what we actually saw. So what we saw was a gapped phase. And there's been a lot of progress by people like my colleague, Mike Zalatel on sort of entanglement signatures of different gap phases. And you know you can do those tests and figure out which one you have. It seems actually to be a chiral spin liquid of the type that Kalmeyer and Laughlin proposed, which is very much like a lattice version of the fractional quantum Hall effect. So it's a fractional state um, with a gap and with edge modes and things like that. I'll say a little bit more about that state, but first I, I mostly wanna focus in this talk on why it happens. So rather than just saying, you know, the computer is a black box and it told us this phase is here, which is what we, we, we said in this 2020 paper and, and other people maybe agree. Uh, I, I think we have a picture for why it happens that I find kind of attractive and that I wanted to share with some of the experts here. But if, if you want details on, you know, how do we do numerical checks and all that and what are some of the other papers, then you could look at this 2020 paper. Um, so there are many different candidate spin liquids here. Um, and I'm not gonna try to go through the full taxonomy of different possibilities. Uh, the one we thought we might see based on work of other people was a gapless spin liquid with a Fermi surface of spin-ons. And I'll mention a paper that, that claims to see that experimentally on the triangular lattice um, in a little while. Um, but you know, of gap spin liquids, so the, the first 
input from numerics is that there seems to be a gap, there are already different types. There's one that breaks time reversal and has an edge state, which is the chiral spin liquid. And there's one that doesn't break time reversal and doesn't have an edge state, which would be uh, more like Anderson's original RVB proposal, the so-called Z2 spin liquid. Um, but this is where I would kind of stress, we can do numerical tests, you know, not just time reversal breaking, but other things. And what's living in our simulation, at least, is the chiral spin liquid. Um, and one consequence of the pandemic is that Roderick and I uh, finally finished our book. And this part is good because he wrote it. So if you want to read the full taxonomy of different spin liquid possibilities, um, that's one place. So focusing on what we did, um, as I mentioned, as we get close to the Mott transition, there are extra couplings. It's no longer just the nearest neighbor Heisenberg model. And we kind of know what those couplings are. And the leading one is a four spin coupling. And what I want to talk about is kind of a souped up mean field theory, where the basic idea, this again is work of my student Tessa, largely, um, is that you can rewrite the couplings that appear near the Mott transition, uh, like the four spin coupling, as a polynomial, um, a fairly complicated polynomial, but a polynomial in the scalar spin chirality. And then you can ask, what are the signs in that polynomial? And does it look like it will have a minimum you know, treating the scalar chirality, which is an operator, treating it as a number, will it have a non-zero, uh, will it have a minimum at a non-zero value of the scalar spin chirality? And then you can go a step further. So, you know, just to kind of explain uh, the usual caveats, um, there are a lot of competing possible states and we can see those states at different values of the next neighbor coupling J2 and the four spin coupling J4. Um, one thing we have a hard time seeing actually is the, the spin on Fermi surface that we thought would originally be there. It seems like you really have to crank up the four spin coupling to such a value that it's not there in just the Hubbard model. You would need it, you know, you, you could have it, but it would depend on the material, say, having other exchange paths or not being two dimensional or whatever. If you're restricted to the Hubbard model, because we have to pick something to study, then the Hubbard model has its additional couplings appearing in a particular pattern where the dominant one is really this four spin interaction, which I've written out here. And the point I'm making is that the four spin interaction actually does, with just some kind of advanced undergraduate algebra and mathematica, the four spin coupling does have a tendency to drive scalar chirality. And then it was kind of known, once you've got scalar chirality, that's a bit like having a magnetic field in the fractional quantum Hall effect, then people had worked out that the chiral spin liquid is sort of a logical state. Um, but again, you know, if you slightly change parameters, you would get a, a different state. It's not that everything is always chiral spin liquid, but in the Hubbard model, with the particular combination of parameters that describes the Hubbard model near the Mott transition, we get a chiral spin liquid. Um, so what I mentioned about rewriting, this is the four spin term, but I can rewrite that as this particular polynomial with weird coefficients of the scalar chirality. And then the kind of souped up mean field theory just to ask, okay, uh, let's pick a value of the scalar chirality that minimizes the energy. Uh, let's then recalculate everything in that value of the chirality and see what chiral order do we get and ask, is it kind of self-consistent? So if you remember like mean field theory of the Ising model that we teach in class, the key step is kind of the self-consistency where you ask, okay, my neighbors are producing a field and I'm responding to that field and getting some order. Uh, now is the order that I got from the applied field consistent with what I assumed about the neighbors. Um, so we're doing the same thing, except now it requires a computer and all. Um, and we do get a self-consistent regime, which is very consistent with the original unbiased Hubbard model simulation. Um, so it seems to hang together that this is actually the mechanism for the chiral spin liquid we found. It's that the four spin coupling is, is driving something. Um, so that's all theory on one particular model. Um, as I mentioned, maybe the the other groups that are starting to see what we see as far as the chiral spin liquid are people like Donna Shang at uh, Northridge and Andreas Weichselbaum at Brookhaven. Um, now the hard part is the experimental situation because we can't do as well as we did in 1D about saying, you know, if this is our state, this is what you will see in neutrons. We can say a little bit about other probes, but the smoking gun for the state we want has not yet been seen. There is some neat experimental progress though that I wanna talk about even if it's not exactly seeing what we would want. Um, but I do think going forward, dynamical probes might be a, a, a new ingredient where we can't really calculate them well with classical computation, although we try, I mean, I'll show the best we can, um, but maybe some new results on dynamical correlation functions would help us differentiate the different possible phases. So now on to experiments. Um, in the old days, one reason why people thought experimentally that maybe the triangular lattice could have a 
spin on Fermi surface was this organic material uh, because it seemed to show a very large thermal conductivity at low temperature. Um, but Martin Dressel and collaborators got you know, samples 10 years later, better samples, better measurements, and so on, and they conclude that there's a gap. They interpret the gap, though, as, as not breaking time reversal. They don't have a direct measurement, but I think uh, you know, they, they do the responsible experimental thing, which is to take the simplest explanation consistent with the data. Um, so this science paper from April last year uh, says that at least there is a gap. What we'd really like to see would be a signature of time reversal breaking or the scalar chirality. And this state should have an edge state thermal conductance, which is twice as large as the kind of Majorana thermal conductance I think you might've heard about from Yuji Matsuda. So there is a new family of inorganic triangular lattice crystals that several groups are studying. And I'll talk about the experimental situation for those, but it's primarily with neutron scattering. And there we're really reaching the limits of what we can calculate because I said DMRG was getting pretty good for ground states in 2D, but uh, dynamical spin correlation functions for neutron scattering were not nearly as good. Um, so our favorite story, and this is, uh, just recently on the archive, again, it's got a lot of people, but uh, led by the Tennessee folks. Um, it seems that this triangular lattice antiferromagnet has something like critical behavior. And with a lot of theoretical modeling, um, so the critical behavior is there in the data um, to try to figure out what it means. Like for example, is it a critical phase or a critical point? Um, our best fit by combining a lot of things, including uh, Schwinger boson work by Christian Batista, is that it seems to be uh, actually in between two gapped phases, uh, sorry, two conventional, uh, two non-critical phases, I should say, I guess a three sublattice ordered phase and a gapped quantum spin liquid. Um, but a different compound in the same family um, studied by Peng Cheng Dai and collaborators is interpreted as showing that spin on Fermi surface. Um, so these are not inconsistent because they're different materials, uh, but I, I don't know that that paper has quite as much theoretical modeling. So it'd be really interesting if there is some kind of common ground on these triangular lattice compounds, but that's sort of where we are. It's, uh, it's not a solved problem, especially um, when it comes to confronting theory of the experiment. Joe, have, have you checked for three spin order by applying a magnetic field and doing inelastic neutrons? Um, whether, so like whether a magnetic field would push it into, okay, so the so, so a small magnetic field with a three spin order produces an S cross S type polarization, right? This is yeah, that's right. I, I don't that up from the from the neutron scattering. It's a good question. I am not aware of studies in a field in either one of these papers, but I could be wrong. Um, the one thing I can say is at we, we you know we did like try to fit spin waves of three sublattice orders. So when I say SW2, I mean, can we fit the neutron scattering data that we have with the spin waves of three sublattice order? And it looks pretty different. Mm. I think that's the most I can say. Okay. Um, so anyway, so now, you know, how are we ever going to calculate quantum dynamics? So DMRG, you know, continues to get gradually better, but S of Q omega in two dimensions, you know, we, we did try to push the state of the art to compare to that triangular lattice data, but we can't even do you know, six or eight by infinity, we, we, we can do more like four by infinity and some interpolation. So I don't know that we're magically going to start being able to calculate S of Q omega on classical computers for extended two or three dimensional systems. Um, but it turns out that that problem um, is actually interesting uh, and maybe better than computer science problems like factoring for the quantum computers that are emerging now. So for my last three or four minutes, uh, I wanna say a bit about, you know, why do those people start to care about our problem? So if I look at factoring, for example, factoring was always sold as this is a problem that is very fast on quantum computers. And the, the, that's true, but it's not very robust. If your quantum computers have a little bit of error, um, they're no longer as good for things like factoring large integers and so on. So an advantage of using quantum computers for quantum matter is that many of our problems have a little bit of robustness. You know, we, we know that they happen in imperfect solids and things like that. Um, the disadvantage compared to factoring is that factoring is very easy to verify. If I tell you these are the factors of some giant integer, you can just multiply them and know if I'm telling you the truth. Well, now that quantum computers are beyond classical computers in some ways, uh, they're at least beyond simple classical checking, um, we don't have a direct classical computational check that our quantum computer is right about S of Q omega. But we do have an experimental check. So in that sense, if we believe that neutron scattering is actually measuring S of Q omega, you know, this four dimensional data set 
on a pretty well-characterized Hamiltonian in some cases, that is a very stringent test for a quantum computation. And that's really one reason why people care about quantum magnetism problems now. They've realized these are problems that have some robustness and some verifiability. And finally, they're dynamics problems, um, which is good because quantum computers are actually a little bit better for dynamics than for ground states, uh, at least at the moment. So there is stuff coming out. And one paper I thought I'd mention, I, it'll probably appear later this morning. Uh, so one kind of topological spin liquid that is maybe the simplest model of a Z2 spin liquid is the so-called toric code. And that's actually been created on a quantum computer in this uh, big collaboration of Microsoft and Google. Um, they have built the toric code and demonstrated the, the braiding of fractional particles. Um, so that is an impressive reproduction of, of the model. Um, and the hope is that you know in a few years, they will be able to tell us about models that we don't understand quite as well. Um, and we've done, I, for the first time, I did my own spin calculation on a quantum computer a few months ago, which was about quantum criticality with Maxime Dupont. Um, but it seems like there's at least a pathway out there where with small improvements in the quantum hardware, they will start to be better than classical hardware for this class of problems that quantum magnetism people care about. Thank so with that- I, I share a famous, just a quick question. Uh, right, I'm just confused about it myself. Um, so you're saying uh, concepts are, are hard to compute, uh, but I call the computer, I call the message. But when you compute a SQ of omega, so then you response, right? So it basically rests on the knowledge of your equilibrium state, right? your, your planet and uh, temperature, uh, 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 ensemble. So, so how can you get get around the fact that you don't know really your equilibrium state, but you can still compute reliably uh, dynamic response function? Yeah, the idea would be you can do S of Q omega at some larger temperature. So, like, okay, and hopefully that will still have signatures. So, it, it's a good point, which is uh, if I wanted S of Q omega in the ground state, I would probably have to prepare the ground state. So, I, I wouldn't have really made my life any easier. Um, but what they can, you know, the hope based on the way some experiments seem to work is that the neutron scattering is not always evolving massively with temperature. And the hope would be that if you're doing neutron scattering at, you know, 10 or 20 Kelvin, you, you, you wouldn't have to sort out these very small energy differences that you have to sort out to get to the right ground state. I said, bottom line is, right, that, that this usual uh, kind of temperature takes out complexity uh, from the problem when you are linear response. How do you try to profit from that? I That's think right. It's, it's the, That's yeah. right. And, and yeah. That's right. Yeah, so uh, I, I think I've said what I wanted to say to kind of lead into the next talk. So um, thanks to everyone for listening. I guess I, I hope I presented 1D. We can do a lot and we even can understand some things that uh, even about the good old Heisenberg chain and see them experimentally. And then 2D is still a frontier. Um, I did try to present one piece of new physics, which is the triangular lattice. Um, but I think there's some hope that there will be progress from an unexpected direction. Uh, let me thank a couple of people. So I, there are a lot of people involved in different stages of this work. Um, the pictures are of two of the junior people. Uh, Nick Sherman was actually trained by Rajiv before coming to me as a graduate student. So he came knowing a lot of quantum magnetism. And then Maxime Dupont did a lot of both classical and quantum computation. And he's in the process of moving to Rigetti quantum computing, uh, which is also in Berkeley, but he'll still be doing quantum condensed matter. He tells me he'll just be doing different computers. Um, so thanks very much. Well, thank you, Joel, for a very exciting talk. We had a lot of questions uh, during the uh, talk, but we, uh, the floor is still open for questions. I think we have time. Our next uh, talk does not start till 10.30, so we do have time. Uh, Hans Henning. Yeah, hello. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So actually, I have two questions. The first is about your proposal for NMR work in the 1D Heisenberg antiferromagnetic chain. So, um, well, 10 years ago, we have done quite a detailed uh, dynamics study with NMR on the uh, 1D antiferromagnetic Heisenberg chain from all the way from the low fields up to the um, above the critical field into the ferromagnetic polarized state. So therefore, the, we had a system, a different one than Stephen Nagler was talking about, but I think that doesn't matter. So in principle, we know very well how to look at these data and how to understand them. So what actually was is your specific- Yeah, well, that, that's great. I mean, we, so we did a good look. I, I will send you our paper and you can see the ones that we, the, the experimental papers that we were able to find. It's entirely possible that we missed one. I, I think what we were able to find, 
Okay, so at high field, the physics will change a bit, but yeah, at low field, um, the examples we were able to find were fit in terms of diffusion, but there was a small enough number of points that it wasn't clear to me that it was a strict proof that spin was diffusive in the Heisenberg model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so what we would say is if, if, if someone could take a few more points, or if you already have the points, that's fantastic. I think there's a way to fit points that would differentiate between uh, diffusion and KPZ. And you know, in, in, 10 years ago, we didn't know about KPZ. It wasn't a reasonable thing to fit to. But let me send you uh, what we have. And you know, mm. and my apologies in advance if, if yours is not one of the papers that we cited. But our goal was, yeah, we, we did try to look out there. And the ones we found, at least all the data that we could find on Heisenberg compounds had been interpreted in terms of diffusion, but could equally well be interpreted in terms of KPZ. Mm -hmm. So uh, to, to, uh, let me consider the, with your talk what I heard. I mean, uh, in NMR, you integrate over the full uh, Q space. So basically in the 1D chain, you have you integrate at very low energies, of course, about the relaxation. And that means you are really looking at the, um, in the, at the Q equal pi point, at the Q equal zero point. These are the two most important points. And uh, what is there at excitations at very low energies. And so is it a problem for you, the kind of physics you look at that we do this integration and that these two points actually move as a function of field uh, through the Brion zone? I, I mean, we, so Maxime, the, the postdoc I worked with on this has actually some previous experience comparing to NMR. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that our, our claim would be even with the integration that is done, uh, there is still a signal. I mean, if you want, let me show you, let me see if I can get my screen back up and show you uh, what I think is, is visible. Um, sorry, it's taking me a second here. All right. Uh, Yeah, so this is the spin, you know, the on-site spin autocorrelator uh, as a function of time. So this is pretty close to the NMR observable. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be if you if you can uh, get to long enough times, that's maybe part of the challenge, um, but there is this, you know, th there's a lot of stuff going on, but then eventually there is this T to the minus two thirds onset. And we think there is a way to look at data. I mean, we, we, we did try to be decent theorists and talk about how this could be seen in experiment in our paper. So. Um, mm. I, I do think there is a way to fit the data that would make clear whether you're seeing this or whether you're seeing diffusion. So long times meet really very low frequencies, so low to frequency. speak. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, I, we have two more hands up. Uh, oh, sorry, Jan no, and then Hey Young. Coming. Yes, I'm coming. Hi, yeah, Joel, just, just to complete the picture, right? Going back to my first question about how uh, robust the hydro type, type, type dynamics is. Uh, I may have missed it because it was just a lot when you were talking, um, but you didn't really talk about the Heisenberg point, right? So for the U1, for the free field theory, yes, I understand it directly, but I could imagine that when it gets sort of seriously, you know, interacting in a way, although still integrable, that the rules could change. Uh, what can you say about that? Yeah, so they definitely can. So for example, uh, the Ising limit is still integrable, but not a CFT at low energy because it has an energy yeah. gap. And the Heisenberg right. point is right on this cusp where you're about to open a gap and that's why some things start to change. So it's still, yeah. Heisenberg yeah. point is kind of still a CFT, but right on the threshold. Um, so I, I think, uh, I mean, one thing that we've worked on sort of in parallel was if you don't have integrability, uh, like the way a generic one dimensional metal works, is that it is in a sense integrable low energy limit because it's a Luttinger liquid at low energy, um, but at any non-zero energy, we know there are irrelevant terms, but they're kind of dangerously irrelevant yeah, because the, it's yeah. the corrections to the Luttinger liquid that make the conductivity finite and things like that. And you can sort of see us, I mean, one reason why we wrote this paper was we'd previously worked on this kind of crossover or competition in non-integrable models. So we were curious how it would be modified in the integral case. So I think there's a general feature where um, the moment you go, okay, I think the way I would state it is, we're used to thinking of long time as always controlled by the UV limit theory, but in problems where integrability is a factor, uh, that's not quite right uh, because you know it could be that the low energy limit is a free theory even like the Luttinger liquid, but right. that doesn't mean that if you take a one dimensional metal at finite temperature, it will become perfectly ballistic if you wait long enough. 
uh, it's kind of like the fact that you've broken integrability doesn't go away. Um, yeah. So in that sense, I would say long time is not exactly the same as saying that irrelevant perturbations don't matter because they could be sort of dangerously irrelevant for dynamics. But, but, but back, right? So, so when you go to the Heisenberg point, right? Where you have this, it's a real critical state being integrable. Um, right? And um, you can map that on a CFT, which is not a free CFT, right? But it's called now, so I forgot, but uh, there's a good name. Um, and then you can ask again the question, right? So, so the CFT integrability may be different from the beta answer lattice model integrability. Is that the factor that's scoring up the dynamics? Is that the way to think about it? I think I, sort of. I mean, I think the way I think about it is if I, okay, if I think about what, why is the Heisenberg model different from the others? I, we know that the key ingredient is a kind of isotropy, the fact that now, I've got an SU2 symmetry. And in general, we, we, we've studied other models where yeah. K, and gotten KPZ to emerge. What you need is some kind of uh, isotropy. And the way to think about that is, for me, it's think about like modes on a nonlinear sigma model. So if I've got modes on the sphere, like for a Heisenberg model, they sort of interact with each other because of the curvature of the sphere. Um, that's the, the, so it's different from a circle. Like if you want the circle, the... Uh, Nonlinear sigma model is absolutely free. Well, in the Heisenberg model, it's only kind of asymptotically free, but there is this interaction. And that, that interaction, when you've got a higher symmetry, which means you've got a curved nonlinear sigma model, that's sort of where the nonlinearity term is coming from, is how I would express it. Uh, but anyway, the key ingredients for KPZ are, yes, not just integrability, but some additional, um, some continuous symmetry larger than U1, like SU2, SU3, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, get it. But now, yeah, now we're kind of reaching the limits of what I think is, is like, as I mentioned, there is no derivation of KPZ in detail. There's just yeah. a brute force yeah. calculation Z equal to three halves right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it is cool stuff, uh, Joel. Thanks. Hi, Young. Hey, hey, Young. Yes, okay, thank you. Hi, Joel. Um, so I have a question about your chiral spin liquid, um, as you know very well. When we are talking about those spin liquid, we are talking about the statistics of the fractionalized particles. So there are different chiral spin liquids with the different uh, fractionalized particles. Um, and uh, you know, the way I see it, uh, maybe you have done the calculations, but have you looked at like a braiding of which, what type of the chiral spin liquid that you are seeing in here? Like what is yeah, the- Yeah, no, that's a good point. I oversimplified a little. The, uh... The one that we see is the one that is very close to the new equal to one half state or like the, the original sort of Kallmeyer Laughlin proposal. And the kind of calculation we've done is, you know, we've got a cylinder uh, where we're making the state and we put different fluxes on the cylinder and see, I mean, this is kind of in, in picture B, but it would be a little lengthy to explain in detail, but basically we, we can create the quasi particles by adding fluxes through the cylinder and kind of map out different topological sectors um, and as far as we can tell, it's uh, like the new equal to one half fractional quantum Hall state is probably the way I would describe it. But so you're looking at the numerically, you're looking at the topological disappearances. Yeah, exactly. So, but there are other ways that uh, one can do, such as like a modular S matrix in the DMLG calculations. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we tried a few things. I don't know that we've done everything, but uh, yeah, th th there could be other things to try. Um, but at least the, we, we, we tried enough things that we couldn't figure out any competing state that made sense besides this one. That's probably yeah, and can I, yeah, okay. So can I also make a one comment because you seems to, you know, kind of giving an idea that the, to get a chiral spin liquid, um, you need to be push the system into a metal insulator close to the, some kind of charge fluctuation near the metal to insulator to get a high order terms. But on the other hand, there are other ways because such as git type model, you don't have to be near the metal because- Oh yeah, other, other lattices, that's yeah, certainly other, true. Other situations where you just have a Zeman field, you just end up with, you know, immediately git types, chiral that's right, git types. That's right, right. So, no, yeah, that's right. The the yeah. Is completely different. <laughs> That's yeah, a good clarification. Yeah. yeah, yeah. On the triangular lattice, this is happening as some kind of intermediate behavior where you have to tune a little bit U. Right. I mean, in some lattices, sense, you lattice. generate the chiral terms through this ring change terms, but I wonder if there's other way to do it uh, without having the higher ring terms. Um, I think on other lattices, yes. On the on the triangular lattice, the problem is that the nearest neighbor term we kind of know what it does, and it's pretty sub lattice and hard to get around it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Peter, Peter, and then Pierce. Hi, Joel. Thanks for the talk. 
So um, I was wondering if you have some, and you may you may not have uh, much uh, opinion on this, but I'm wondering, you know, when you when you look at the kinds of calculations that you guys are doing, um, the different possibilities for different kinds of spin liquids, different kinds of hydrodynamic regimes, do you do you get some sense that uh, the current experimental techniques, which are popular, um, you know, that we, we kind of are kind of inadequate in some ways for, for answering some of these questions. You know, some of the, you know, some of the, as I understood, you know, some of the models that you, uh, the, the, the calculations you did explicitly are kind of, let's say, reproduced poorly by experiments. I mean, you showed uh, heat diffusion, for instance, happening there, but it was in a sense like following things really kind of locally. You know, as I understood, you know, you put heat in some you know, some particular place in a system, and you're watching how it was diffusing out. And those are not the kinds of things that we generally measure often in, in materials like spin liquids. Do you think there needs to be a, a push to doing different kinds of? I think it would be nice. I mean, for one thing, yeah, I think both in terms of frequency and in terms of coupling. I mean, I know of a few beautiful optical experiments with spin dynamics. Um, you know, the measurement of spin coulomb drag, but they all kind of depend on. Uh, at least some of them depend on having a special material where the coupling to light is especially good and well understood. Like gallium arsenide happens to have some nice ability to pump spin and things like that. When it goes to these insulating magnets, um, like in principle, for example, you know, different kinds of X-ray scattering or low frequency optics would be more relevant for many of the, the long time regimes I was talk talking about. Uh, I would love for it to work, but I guess it seems hard to measure some of the spin dynamics as precisely as you can with neutron scattering. But so in other words, like the, the kind of experiment that we were building, it is similar in spirit to what people like Bob Dines did a, a while ago, where you heat up a region and then you kind of track the spread of various excitations as they take that energy away. And that was a laser experiment in, in the early days. Um, but I don't know that it's feasible at the kind of length scales and temperatures we would want. But if you can do it, I mean, if you can, I know you've got quasi 1D compounds and I know you've got nice lasers. So if you can cool one down and think of a way to kind of uh, locally heat a region and then track the spread of energy, that's exactly what we would want. So if that if that is a doable experiment, we have predictions both for the integrable and non-integrable cases. Um, and we'd kind of love it. Mm -hmm. So do you think, does it seem... Oh, I, I don't know. I, I, would need, I need to think about it. I mean, the, the one, one, one intrinsic difficulty with light and these kinds of things is that you is the typical mismatch of, of, uh, of frequency and, and momentum, you know, yep. uh, or let's say length scales, right? You know, you want low energies, but that means uh, typically long lengths. So, you know, I, I can deposit on a small, you know, on one and a half EV photon, which is 15,000 degrees in temperature units that has a length scale of about a micron, right? Which is already pretty long length. Um, so that this is always, a, I, I, maybe, maybe such experiments can be done. I, I need to think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think that- This the is always a difficulty be... with trying to think about how to combine length sure. scale measurements and light is it's just kind of intrinsic mismatch of, of length and frequency. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, if you want, looking at the potassium copper fluoride, I mean, the, the nice thing there Okay, so let's say I believe ultimately the spin dynamics should be diffusive because it is happening in a solid. You will eventually lose your angular momentum to phonons and things like that. Um, but it seems that you know the time scale in this experiment, which corresponds to 0.7 MeV up to say, um, that is long enough for interesting physics, but not so long that it has become diffusive for kind of boring reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so that frequency range is, I think, accessible. Uh, but you're right that the length scale may be kind of mismatched with it. But at least the you know, the range of times over which the interesting spin dynamics is happening doesn't seem you know, prohibitive from the point of view of tabletop optics. Right. Yes, and then after that, we should give Joel a break. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Joel, wonderful talk. I was very heartened by your remarks about hydrodynamics and the use of, of Boltzmann's equation. Um, uh, actually, a historical note, Boltzmann's equation actually dates back to Maxwell wrote it down in the 1870s or something like that so it's amazing but my question to you was um do you think that similar approaches might be useful to trying for trying to solve the problem of the strange metal uh in two and higher dimensions uh this is clearly a great mystery that we have uh in condensed matter physics at the moment and i wonder whether the insights you've gained from looking at one dimension might give some clues as to what one might do next yeah, um, 
this, this uh, the the specific mechanism in this talk, I think, is pretty hard to translate to higher dimensions. And it, it would be along the lines of you know something we've tried as a community for many years is to get things like higher dimensional Luttinger liquids, higher dimensional bosonization, things like that. And it's not very easy uh, in general. But here, this is kind of saying if you if you could somehow have a collision term in higher dimensions that sort of didn't have angular information. You know, the big change about collisions in higher dimensions in the Boltzmann equation is that, uh, you know, two things can change their angle, but in 1D, there are no angles. So right. you kind of need things that are moving, you know, there is some work, it's kind of in the far out uh, lattice model uh, world, but you can make models in higher dimensions that have aspects of one dimensional dynamics, like these fracton models. Uh, but, you know, the connection between those and the usual Hamiltonians we write down is pretty rare. I mean, one particular thing we are, trying to wrap up in 1D is trying to see a strange metal in our computer. Like it's fairly hard to find actually a dynamical regime in 1D with linear T conductivity. Let's take linear and T, sorry, linear T resistivity. Let's take linear T resistivity as one strange metal feature. Um, we can sort of build one, but it's more like a Dirac fluid in 1D than mm -hmm. it is like, uh, it, so yeah, the, the, the kind of challenge was, can you make something that looks a bit uh, strange metally in, in 1D Aside, aside from the other kinds of strange metals we have in 1D, one, one that's more like the two and 3D strange metals. And we sort of have an example, but I would say it's not, uh, it's very specific to like Dirac type materials. It might explain some interesting things about graphene say, but it wouldn't be relevant to like the cuprates or something like that. Well, it sounds interesting. Uh, we're, we're just seen a reference if you've written it up. I hope by the end of the month, but we'll see. Okay, very good. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well, actually there are two more uh, hands up. Are you willing to take more questions here? Oh, sure. I have nowhere to go. All right, Daniel and then Silka. Uh, all right, this might be uh, you know, an easy one that you could dismiss as a, as a dumb question, but I was just you know, wondering in, in, in classical physics with the Boltzmann equation, you know, it's necessary to in, in, invoke the Stossel ansatz for particles which are just about to collide, but not for those with the, which have just collided. And it, it seems to be a deep question which has never really been uh, uh, you know, satisfactorily uh, resolved and philosophers write about it. And there's this, you know, Lo Schmidt paradox and whatnot. Is, is there anything in, in the analysis of, in, in you know, the you know, quantum, quantum world which sheds any light on that? I mean, I don't think so because at least, okay, there, there is a crowd of people trying to redo derivations of how classical physics emerges from quantum physics in general. I mean, it, so I, I guess I think of it as like the assumption of molecular chaos or something like that, but it won't be there. I mean, these integral models are quite special. So I think for the equation I wrote down, as I mentioned, there is this work by Essler, I think Bertini and Essler maybe, um, trying to kind of be precise about what limit, where is this the right description uh, of an interacting integral model? I think they're doing lieb Liniger, which is just colliding bosons. Um, so I think I, I think basically the special properties of this interaction mean that you can do things more rigorously, but the things that happen are less interesting. Like there's no growth of entropy, for example. Yeah, but uh, could you use that as a point of departure then to to look at the you know some weakly perturbed uh, you know integral model and say anything? That's a good idea. I mean, I I, I don't. Uh, I mean, we've studied other aspects of weakly perturbing integral models, but I mean, yeah, one thing I. I thought about with no success was how would you improve the Boltzmann equation that I wrote down to kind of incorporate a uh, small integrability breaking. Um, and, you know, and, and I was not able to get a useful equation. So we have some simulations of spin chains with small integrability breaking, but I could not get, and we have, you know, density profiles and things like that and scaling, but I, I could not find an analytic picture for them based, this was work with Vera Bolchandani uh, based on modifying the Boltzmann equation. Uh, so, so I, I think it's a good direction, but I, I did not succeed in it. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks. Can I go next? Yes, so good. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I'm just coming back to the, 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 the question Pierce had. So, um, in, in heavy fermion systems, we have the 3d systems, which, uh, show strange metal behavior near a quantum critical point. And at this quantum critical point, we have essentially momentum independent uh, critical scattering that's seen in the, in the neutron scattering results that sort of the, the, the scattering intensity does not have pronounced K dependence. So would that help to treat them? Um, 
It's a good question. I guess I, I, I mean, I, the problem is usually what we do microscopically is you know try to write down a Hamiltonian and see interesting dynamical signatures of it. And as you know, that's it's hard to do a very detailed calculation, you know, at, at that kind of microscopic level, uh, unless you go to something like an SYK model with all to all interactions and other things where you wouldn't have much of a microscopic justification. I mean, that is, I do think, um, you know, strange metals are another kind of quantum dynamical problem, if you like, where um, it's very much, you know, at the limit or beyond the limit of what we can do with classical approaches, at least the ones that I do. I mean, there may be other things like DMFT that are more applicable, um, but for like the, the sort of lattice model calculations with DMRG, you know, as I mentioned in 1D, we can now get something like a, a slightly strange metal, um, you know, or I, I would call it maybe bad metal is a fair thing to say there. Um, but getting a bad metal in higher dimensions out of a microscopic lattice model calculation, I mean, other people can chime in, but I think that's likely to remain fairly hard. Um, but maybe the NISC quantum computers will, will help us out. I mean, I, I guess, you know, it is interesting. I, I, I agree that the momentum independence is a very interesting input. Um, so maybe you could, okay, maybe you could try to write some effective model that, you know, assumes that kind of, and then from that point is tractable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so there are models, I, you know, it'd be somewhat like local quantum criticality type models. Yep, you know, those exactly. one might be able to do some computation on. Um, I have not done it myself, but I think other people might have, but uh, yeah, but yeah. So then you, you, you'd you be assuming at least part of the answer, but then working from there, I think that could be done. Yeah, yeah. great, thank you. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Joel again, and we'll start again at uh, 10.30. So we have about nine minutes. Luxury. Okay.